Well, good morning, everyone, and, and welcome. My name is Susan Longworth, and I'm a Senior Advisor for Community and Economic Development at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. And thank you all for joining us for this exciting session, which is Revitalizing Communities by Restoring Neighborhood Retail. We have an excellent panel this morning, and I'm certainly going to let them speak for themselves in just a few minutes. Their bios are linked through the agenda, and if you click on those links, you'll also be taken to their organization so you can learn a lot about them, and I'm not going to take any time, any of our time uh, reading any of their bios. But to introduce them briefly in the order they will present, we will have Emily Tallon, who is a professor in the Division of Social Sciences at the University of Chicago. Her research is devoted to urban design and urbanism, and especially the relationship between the built environment and social equity. Next, we will turn to Adriana Abizada, who is Executive Director of the Kensington Corridor Trust in Philadelphia. Her young organization is supporting neighborhood-based property control for long-term equitable revitalization of a key commercial corridor. And we look forward to hearing about KCT's innovative model. And finally, we'll have Calvin Holmes, who is president of the Chicago Community Loan Fund, a community development finance institution that provides a range of financial tools and resources with the aim of stabilizing communities through development efforts that benefit low and moderate income neighborhoods. But before I turn it over to Emily to get us started, I want to frame our conversation within the events of the past year, both the pandemic, but also the racial and social unrest that disproportionately affected the communities and residents we are going to be speaking about. It is no secret that street level retail suffered a significant shock in 2020 as the stay at home orders and fear about the pandemic kept people from visiting these vital community assets. In addition, many of these communities were greatly impacted by destruction following the, the murder of George Floyd. In disinvested communities, this only exacerbated trends that were already underway prior to the pandemic, despite an environment of overall economic expansion. The conversation we'll be having today is not so much about small businesses. Other panels have done a fantastic job of addressing those, as it is about the spaces they occupy, the people they serve through goods and services, but also employment, and the important role they play as community stabilizers enhancing other redevelopment and wealth building efforts. Supporting these places and fostering their revitalization, as you will hear, takes a complex interaction of financing, both public and private, community engagement, municipal investment and leadership, and a multitude of other factors. Our speakers are going to speak for about seven minutes each to introduce us to their work. I then have a few questions lined up to help expand on, but also coalesce what we've been hearing. And then I'm also going to be watching the chat box for your questions and we'll bring those in as well. So I think that is enough talking from me for now. Um, Emily, if you are ready, um, we're gonna turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Susan, for that introduction. Um, I'm going to just be um, rather quickly running through some of the research we've been doing at the Urbanism Lab um, at the University of Chicago, studying this issue of retail. In particular, our interest is really about uh, the activation of the street and what that retail presence means for the social life of neighborhoods. And um, <clears throat> so we want healthy, thriving, functioning streets. Um, and uh, that's, that's really the basis for our, a lot of research we've been doing to try to figure things out. So I'm gonna, any papers I talk about that you want more information on, um, please feel free to reach out um, and go to this uh, website to find them. Um, I just wanna make um, a few points about how retail has been in decline for quite a while. Um, as Susan pointed out, um, the pandemic certainly exacerbated that decline. But um, when you think about storefront retail, it's really kind of a blip on the historical record, which is pretty interesting. Um, when you think about centuries of bazaars and weekly markets and traveling salespeople and direct sales by artisans, and um, to some extent, we've been sort of getting into those sort of pre-commercial corridor retail models, which is very fascinating. Um, 
But this ideal of storefront retail that we've been living with now is really a product of the 19th century and the era of industrial urbanization. And um, there was a transition at that time from temporary markets to um, this fine grain pattern of neighborhood corner stores that we all love. And these became highly, highly valued for very good reason. Um, so the question now is what has been undermining this highly valued model of um, corner stores? Um, well, uh, everybody knows about the, um, the efficiency of the chain store, uh, which is actually um, older than many people think. A&P was a chain grocery store, uh, started in 1859, way, you know, the Walmart before Walmart. Um, and it was at its peak in the 1940s. And these chain stores uh, really began to dominate um, a number of markets within the early decades of the 20th century. Um, and, you know, if you think we're all doing, um, getting everything from Amazon now, well, this was another big blow to um, that sort of Main Street storefront retail that happened um, much earlier than Amazon, and that is the, um, the mail order folks, and, you know, many of them headquartered in Chicago, of course. Um, so the mail order giants like Sears and Roebuck, like Montgomery Ward, um, they really uh, put an incredible stress on our Main Street retail. Um, uh, the suburbanization of retail, um, car dependent retail, then the many subsidies that this model of development has enjoyed over the years. Um, so the upshot here is this move to e-commerce is really only the latest strike um, against um, that's been happening in a centuries long battle um, against um, urban retail as I call it. So now I just want to run through um, uh, some of the research, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, that we've been doing to try to figure out um, some key questions about, uh, I guess I should define my terms, main street retail. And that is that retail that's fronting the street in our neighborhoods and activating um, our neighborhood um, in, in so many different ways, not just commerce, not just exchange, but social connection and employment, as Susan was mentioning. Um, so we wanted to answer a few basic questions. And first of all, where is Main Street and what is Main Street? And uh, we have been looking at different criteria for what that would be and kind of settled on Main Street needing to be about providing services for the local neighborhood, about um, providing opportunity, and that is uh, a source of employment and um, quality uh, pertaining to the pedestrian realm. So really um, making a contribution for, for public space. And um, in Chicago, we mapped all this criteria out. We did a massive quantitative study and found that according to these strict criteria, there were really only 13 blocks in all of Chicago that, that met them. Of course, there's many different ways of of parsing that out. Um, if you relax your criteria a little bit, you can get more Main Street blocks. Um, another uh, question in our research is about, well, what exactly are the benefits of this kind of Main Street retail that many of us are after? And um, we, uh, you know, for that study, we tried to compare a Main Street kind of block against um, a block that's just dominated by a giant chain store. Um, it doesn't have all those variables I mentioned a minute ago and what are what's the outcome of that. And um, we were able to um, uh, find that, you know, a, there were a lot of, sorry, I'm skipping around here. We were able to show quantitatively that these Main Street blocks did have a number of of benefits. Um, also wanted to look at the regulatory context of Main Streets. Are We hear sometimes, we've done some surveys of retailers that um, regulations are hurting urban retail. And um, indeed, um, in Chicago, the zoning regulations are a bit of a mess. Um, you have M1, you know, any given block might, ha might have several different kinds of zones on it. And um, that doesn't really um, foster this, you know, cohesive Main Street um, retail social connector that you're going for. Um, so uh, another key concern, of course, is about urban retail um, 
vacancy rates and, you know, just looking at the difference, the, an odd thing going on in Chicago is market rents going up and vacancy rates going up at the same time. And the market is not really doing the adjusting it's supposed to be doing. So um, this is my last slide because I'm out of time. But, um, you know, some of the, the mitigation strategies we've been um, investigating have to do with uh, vacancy tax relief that might be very specific to Chicago, but retail um, property owners actually getting a break on their property taxes if they keep their properties vacant. And there's been a lot of pushback on that policy. And I, I think there is some movement to get that changed, but it, it has been very detrimental. Um, the need for small grants, the, the need to have more direct involvement in property leasing. We heard we did a survey of chambers of commerce around Chicago, and they were telling us how success really depends on fostering very personal relationships with property owners and being proactive about getting buildings um, uh, least. So um, so I'll stop there because I'm out of time, but um, please do visit my website if you need any more information. Um, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. So uh, let's see, I am turning it over to Adriana. Good morning, everyone. Adriana Pisade with the Kensington Corridor Trust. I'd like to talk to you this morning about the trust structure that we are building in the Kensington neighborhood of Philadelphia, uh, known as a neighborhood trust. And what we do within this neighborhood trust is a variety of things, really targeting the commercial corridor and its revitalization. Uh, so we decommodify assets. Uh, so we take them off of the traditional speculative market, the traditional capital market, and we place them in a trust to do two primary things. One is protect and preserve local control and local governance over those assets. And the second is to preserve affordability over time. Um, both of those practices really combating fairly directly uh, extractive capital practices, which are very common, particularly in communities like Kensington that have seen decades of disinvestment and then ultimately move towards gentrification and see rapid outside investment. And so the neighborhood trust model is really structured to ensure that the neighborhood maintains that ownership of those assets locally, um, and that some of the assets, um, you know, out of the larger kind of portfolio that is available on the avenue is protected for those purposes. And um, so really thinking about value add businesses, thinking about prioritizing black and brown businesses, really thinking about solidarity and restorative economy frameworks. And um, so how do we maintain as many of the dollars as possible within the Kensington neighborhood uh, to really benefit the folks who are living there currently? Uh, but also to support the businesses that have been there historically and new ones that are entering the development of this corridor. You know, the Kensington neighborhood is probably the microcosm of a variety of systemic issues that have been um, facing our nation for quite some time. But in this very particular space, um, which is really depending on whose definition of Kensington you're going with, somewhere between 30 and 45,000 residents. Um, for the very specific area that we are targeting, it is 31,000 residents um, across five census tracts, which are touching a 1.4 mile long corridor. Uh, and in that we have significantly high vacancy. So in a pre-COVID landscape, we had vacancy, depending on the block you were on, between 10 and 30% per block. At this point, we have blocks that are upwards of 60%. This is really compacted by two things, um, you know, which were mentioned at the beginning by Susan, but really both pandemics. So we had the health pandemic and COVID, which forced the closure of a variety of businesses that didn't have access to traditional capital pathways, didn't have banking relationships. Um, and then also in the social uprisings, in the aftermath and murder of George Floyd, uh, the avenue was hit fairly hard um, and we had millions of dollars of property damage, several buildings burned to the ground. Um, and so we are still in the aftermath of, of the rebuilding and of rethinking what the corridor could look like. And a big part of what the Neighborhood Trust is trying to do is ensure that as we are thinking through that collectively, um, that the neighborhood is prioritized. So the folks that live in this community and the folks who have businesses in this community are the ones who are decision makers and power holders versus being um, subject to outside control or outside decision making. 
And so um, the neighborhood trust model is really intended to build that capacity, to build that power and utilize real estate as the tool for that work. Uh, and so right now um, the KCT was, was built in 2019 by four founding partners. Uh, one is a CDC, so a community development corporation called Impact Services. Uh, another is IF Lab, which is a small business incubator based in Kensington, prioritizing black and brown businesses and their move towards brick and mortar. Uh, PIDC, which is the city of Philadelphia's public-private partnership for economic development, and Shift Capital, which is a private developer that has a B Corp status. So um, aside from their traditional bottom line, there's also a social impact mission associated with their work. And those four partners came together in the aftermath of a neighborhood plan um, that was put together by Impact Services in 2016, where there were two kind of culminating results specifically around the corridor, one being uh, the residents and the small businesses wanted to see a reduction in vacancy and blight. It was very clear that that was outlined within the plan. The other being uh, that there was a significant informal economy that exists within Kensington and trying to determine how to formalize that um, and get folks and their entrepreneurial spirit that already existed really mobilized towards thriving and sustainability um, financially, as well as the development and creation of new jobs. And so as the KCT was born and developed, um, it has slowly transitioned control to the neighborhood. So the board and the governing body are now um, almost entirely, but at this point, definitely majority held by residents and small business owners. So as capital is flowing through the KCT and we are making acquisitions, those are being determined by the folks who are in this community and impacted by the work that we will be doing. Um, we have some audacious goals uh, right now. We are um, really fundraising fairly heavily. We have begun doing acquisitions, uh, right? Currently, we've started an 11 lot uh, pollinator garden as a temporary use until we're prepared to develop that space. Um, because the neighborhood trust is centered in neighborhood for us, it is deeply important that we activate spaces in a meaningful way as quickly as possible. Um, even if it means, you know, not doing development and construction at that time or, or rehab. If there's a way for us to engage folks in that space, we want to be able to do that. Um, we are not in the business of throwing chain link fence up around the things that are held by the trust and not making them accessible to the folks that they're being stewarded for. Uh, so a deep commitment there. You know, we really think about it as a, I'm sure many of you have heard kind of the buy back the block approach. It really is that. And we're really looking at it at a property by property. As I said earlier, our corridor is a total of 1.4 miles, uh, but we have really focused our acquisitions and development on three blocks. So we are actively acquiring um, very densely so that we can have high impact, also so that we can really build a, a small business network and community that can rely and depend on each other and support each other as they all continue to move towards sustainability and hopefully thrive in place. Um, I look forward to continuing this discussion and excited to get into the Q&A later. I'm now going to pass it over to my colleague, Calvin Holmes. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Adriana. Uh, good morning to all of you, and thank you for the, the work that you do uh, in this very important arena. Um, I've got a lot of slides, so I'm going to move into it pretty quickly. Um, I want to try and accomplish three things in the time that I have. One, to help you get a sense of why this is so urgent in Chicago. Um, two, to lay out um, three types of activation efforts that are interconnected within an ecosystem uh, driving uh, this work forward in Chicago, and if time permits, touch on a few lessons learned. Uh, Unfortunately, the headlines don't do Chicago justice. Uh, many of you across the country hear about our budget crisis, our public corruption, a teacher strike, gun violence, population loss, uh, but much of our great uh, work goes unheralded by the media. Few people know that we have some of the top public high schools in the country now, that we're the third largest uh, job market uh, for tech sector, that we're the number one destination for corporate relocations, we're the, we're the nerve center for uh, rail, air, and road in the US, and that we're number one in foreign direct investment and have been for many years, and that we are an innovator for community commercial corridors. And this work is particularly urgent uh, here in Chicago because we have a problem um, that we're trying to solve. Uh, we're trying to stop what many are calling the great reverse migration. Uh, Chicago has lost approximately 7% of its population since uh, 2000. And uh, oh, the overwhelming majority of those persons have 
been from the African American community, uh, well over 200,000 people. We're trying to keep our residents in place by improving their commercial corridors, making sure that we're expanding the critical amenities that they need to enjoy their lives in their neighborhoods. We're also trying to provide more locally accessible jobs. We want to expand and lift up local wealth creation. Clearly, we're trying to improve health outcomes and reduce crime in our communities. And we want to attract new residents and businesses to our neighborhoods. The three types of activations uh, are ones that, that we've coined at my agency, and I should have che checked in with Emily beforehand, uh, but we're not academics. But we, we think of this ecosystem as being uh, corridor activation efforts led by the city, ones led by community development corporations on the ground in the neighborhoods, and ones led by intermediaries uh, like CDFIs. In uh, the first category, municipality-led, uh, as is the case for many mayors uh, in, uh, across cities and towns across the country, uh, activating our commercial corridors leads to community vitality, which we all must have. The first program is a very, very important one and robust program. It's the Invest Southwest Initiative, which is a new initiative of our, our brand new mayor, Lightfoot. It's a $1 billion effort uh, to harness all of the city's financial tools uh, around uh, 12 large uh, mixed-use uh, projects in um, yeah, rural wealth communities. Up, and now it won't let me back in because it says I'm still actually Sorry, folks, I'm having a little technical difficulty so right now with my phone. Uh, give me a second. I was on. Give me one second, folks. Um, so the, the idea is to uh, use these large scale mixed use projects uh, as a catalyst for uh, additional development in the retail corridors in these 12 communities. Um, the city is throwing the, 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 the city is throwing the kitchen sink uh, at the development uh, efforts uh, with their tax increment financing, their community development block grants, the low income housing tax credit, home, new market tax credits, bond financing, and a downtown density bonus uh, as well. And in addition to having its toolbox of uh, financial uh, capabilities at the uh, ready for 12 uh, development sites and the development teams, the city is also uh, providing a whole host of infrastructure and develop um, infrastructure investments at these sites, including improving the streets, the sidewalks, the lighting, the signage, uh, transit facilities, and focusing on uh, public safety. Uh, I'm really uh, uh, pleased to say that even though this is a new initiative, um, Invest Southwest has already uh, selected three uh, development teams to move forward in three different communities. Uh, five of those larger scale mixed use projects are actually under review, and we have four more um, that are moving forward through the RFP process. So we uh, expect that Invest Southwest will uh, affect uh, billions of dollars of development in under-resourced communities around the city. The second program that I wanna spotlight is the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund which was established in 2016 under the prior administration. Uh, and it also focuses on the city's uh, south and west sides. And it's a grant program for business owners and, and retail property owners that is designed to be smaller scale, not only to, to work on the intersections, but the in-between uh, uh, spaces as well in commercial corridors and with the smaller properties. So it can support commercial spaces, grocery stores, retail establishments, restaurants, and uh, even cultural uh, venues. And the grants uh, most uh, typically are at $250,000 or less. However, you can apply for a larger grant of $250,000 or more. And some of the grants are even as big as 2.5 million. Um, the, the, the uses of the grant are really terrific. It really covers many of the needs that uh, a property owner or a small business operator would need because uh, these folks haven't been able to build uh, the wealth to start their own business uh, or drive their property uh, to uh, better functionality. So it can cover land acquisition and assembly, uh, building acquisition, demolition, even environmental remediation. Uh, it can cover all the systems repairs uh, and it also can help you with your storefront build out, your facade improvement, uh, minor site improvements like fencing and planters, even security measures. It covers even some of your financing fees and your architectural fees and other soft costs that you need to drive your project forward. And it can include new construction. Uh, this program uh, has been in existence as, as you saw since 2016 and it's awarded hundreds of small business owners and property owners thus far. And uh, my staff counts that there are about $60 million in neighborhood 
with opportunity funds that have been deployed thus far. And then, uh, as is the case, I think, across the country, uh, we're fortunate to have a host of community development corporations, community economic development corporations, uh, collaborations, and chambers of commerce uh, that are the community leaders of their corridors, uh, and they're activating retail districts across the city. This is just a few of them. I'm going to spotlight really quickly uh, three of them that my organization is working with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the first one is the Quad Communities Development Corporation. And they're using uh, tools and strategies like many of you. Um, they're well-known uh, successful tactics to activate retail corridors. Uh, QCDC uh, serves uh, four um, culturally significant communities on Chicago's South Side, just south of downtown. It's a nonprofit economic development corporation. Um, like all of the groups that I'm going to highlight, the work that QCDC is doing sits inside of a community-driven comprehensive redevelopment plan, and they're lifting up the retail corridor segment of it. So they are a developer assistant, um, and they provide an enormous amount of advice. They help their uh, developers with tenant recruitment and other uh, curating services for those businesses. They provide small business grant facilitation, and they coordinate a number of grant programs for small businesses as a delegate agency of the city of Chicago. They provide an array of small business advisory services. They've helped uh, their small businesses get better at e-commerce, and they even have a platform to help the businesses in the neighborhood uh, sell their goods. Um, they have a wonderful uh, information clearing house uh, for their small businesses and they engage in quite a bit of creative placemaking. I'm really uh, uh, proud to say that QCDC, which is a relatively young organization, uh, helped uh, facilitate the development of a large mixed-use uh, property in their community that is now the home to a, a Walmart uh, urban store with a healthy foods uh, grocery uh, within it. Uh, and they've supported 250 businesses uh, over the years. And most recently, uh, they participated in a mixed-use project called 4400 Grove, which is attracting 12 local uh, person of color owned businesses, uh, including, uh, I think it's the first black owned winery uh, in the city of Chicago. And the um, community activation work that they do with their Bronzeville Knights uh, program and their uh, art gallery um, trolley hop uh, has drawn people from all over the region. Another um, very successful community led uh, uh, initiative is uh, driven by the Chicago Neighborhood Initiatives uh, Organization, which is a, a multi-sector uh, community development corporation, a nonprofit operating in a community called Pullman, which is uh, about 15 miles south of Chicago. Uh, one of the reasons why the CNI story is quite remarkable is that this is a neighborhood that really uh, quite frankly, wasn't on anyone's radar. It wasn't a priority of the city at the time uh, or the foundation community or the corporate community. Um, and working within a very uh, community-driven comprehensive redevelopment plan, um, C, uh, the CNI uh, Development Corporation decided that it would be a multi-sector real estate developer to drive demand uh, within the corridor. So they've supported the development and developed um, a warehouse facility for Amazon, for Whole Foods. Um, they've got uh, a, a huge uh, facility for um, a, uh, a, a healthy uh, uh, farming um, operation um, and a um, <clears throat> environmentally responsible products, products manufacturing company. Um, they've been uh, uh, drawn in an anchor institution in the um, uh, Pullman National Monument uh, Federal District, uh, which is going to bring in thousands of tourists to the neighborhood. They've developed a massive uh, uh, indoor community recreation facility, which is now the largest indoor recreation facility in the state of Illinois. Uh, they've also engaged in affordable housing development. And all of this is going to uh, support the, the retail corridors in the community. They've been successful in attracting a Walmart Super Center. They most recently opened a small retail center that is a business incubator for a number of African-American owned restaurants. And the, the longitudinal impacts of uh, CNI's work already is really impressive. Um, the poverty rate has dropped in the past 10 years from uh, one of 39% down to 31%. Uh, median incomes have jumped from, um, have jumped uh, up to um, 
50 uh, have, have jumped uh, from from being pretty low to having 56 percent of the community residents earning a, a good wage. Uh, unemployment is actually down from a peak during the last Great Recession of 37 percent to 31 percent, and it's continuing to, to go down. And really impressively, because they brought so much uh, retail online. Um, they've had 112% growth in the amount of shopping dollars that are spent in the neighborhood. The next uh, community uh, corridor activator that I want to highlight is the Greater Chatham Initiative, which uh, came together because uh, the, the city, uh, corporate Chicago, and, and most importantly, community residents recognize that a, a legacy middle-class African-American community about 10 miles south of downtown was, was starting to um, slip towards poverty and decay and they, they wanted to forestall that so the greater chatham initiative a nonprofit community development corporation was established and they like many of you uh, engage in creative placemaking they uh, have focused with laser precision on advisory services for legacy merchants um, they've done an amazing job of marketing the neighborhood as a destination zone for uh, the entirety of the south side and and for the african-american community it might be for the whole region and they've uh, done well with business loan facilitation and uh, helping businesses secure small business grants. One of their um, hallmark marquee projects is the 75th Street Boardwalk, uh, which really has become uh, an area of play uh, for, for much of the South Side, certainly in the African American community, with a host of restaurants and bars and delis and bakeries uh, and places to just hang out and have a great time on the South Side. Um, uh, Greater Chatham Initiative reports that uh, when they are activating the boardwalk, that sales for the restaurants uh, increase by 10 to 30 percent and capital investment um, f uh, from those legacy uh, merchant businesses up pretty substantially. We've got a number of them who are remodeling their locations. Um, one of the, the best known uh, vegan restaurants in the city is Solvage, and they've recently bought their building and had a massive uh, remodeling and the space looks fantastic. So we're really proud of the work that uh, Greater Chatham Initiative is doing. The third uh, category in our ecosystem is the intermediary work um, that is being led by uh, CDFIs like my organization, the Chicago Community Loan Fund, and another uh, CDFI. Um, we got into the retail space. We've been a housing uh, lender primarily for a number of years, and we recognize as we evolve that we needed to work in other areas to help drive um, community development and build healthy communities and working in retail was really important. So we organized the $25 million fund um, to help activate the corridors, uh, to make sure that residents and communities had better services, to try and attract more national and regional retailers as well, to uh, again, boost local job creation, to make sure there was healthier food uh, from both grocery stores and restaurants. And, and as Greater Chatham Initiative is doing, to give people in, uh, amenity desert communities, more places to play and to build those stronger local economies. Uh, we launched the Activate Retail Initiative about five years ago. We're really proud of our successes. We've uh, provided 35 loans across $45 million in deployment. Uh, we've supported 1,100 uh, jobs and um, stabilized or created 7.5 million dollar, 7.5 million um, square feet of uh, commercial retail space. We organize an enormous number of partners, uh, both as operating support providers, uh, debt providers, and sub debt providers, uh, co lenders, um, and technical assistance providers to, to help us achieve these successes. Um, our toolbox is primarily financing different types of loans, pre development, construction, permanent subordinate financing and some equity financing on a case by case basis, or I should say equity like financing. But the real story there isn't the financial products. It's about our approach to lending to retail. First and foremost, we want to do it. We're interested in retail, even in the face of e-commerce. We're comfortable with new property owners. We're comfortable with property owners uh, leasing to brand new businesses, startup businesses. Um, we're comfortable with higher non-conforming loan to values. Um, we're okay if the developers only have letters of interest instead of signed leases. Um, we don't actually need a credit tenants uh, and we don't need for the anchor of the project to be an a credit tenant. We're comfortable with higher debt service coverage ratios, our developers having lower liquidity ratios and net worth. Um, so just that framework alone makes it possible for us to support retail in these communities. And then we knew that the technical assistance that we were providing wouldn't be enough. So we proactively partnered with another public benefit corporation called the Chicago Trend um, 
uh, Corporation, and uh, they are bringing to bear a whole host of additional deeper technical assistance services uh, to the projects that we're collaborating with them around, including uh, specific uh, small operating business advisory services, real estate development advisory services, and they've got a new uh, venture where uh, the corporation itself is uh, bringing other parties to the table to actually purchase uh, retail properties in low-income communities where Trend will be a part owner, other neighborhood entrepreneurs will be an owner, and they've even got a little sliver of it that can go to crowdfunding so that the community itself can get in on the act and also own the assets in the neighborhood for greater community control. Um, uh, Trend has done uh, great work over the five years that we've partnered with them, supporting uh, a total of nine projects, uh, allowing us to invest uh, almost $9 million, and we're really pleased that 92% have involved entrepreneurs of color, 55% of those projects have been in opportunity zones, and 43% of them have been in these targeted um, south and west side communities. The other uh, CDFI initiative that's very important that I want to quickly highlight is one being led by the List Chicago um, uh, office, and it's called Chicago Yield, and it's taken a different approach. Um, and, instead of uh, focusing more on sort of the lending uh, toolbox, in this case, they're wrapping their arms around a cohort of um, black and brown developers uh, who are bringing projects online in corridors around the city. Um, it's really a, essentially a, a three stool approach where they're uh, building a um, learning uh, network uh, for this cohort of developers. They have very specific referral and working sessions uh, with uh, those developers. And then LISC itself uh, provides customized coaching and TA to help boost the capacity of these black and brown developers. Uh, to date, they've got 11 developers in their pipeline, and it uh, portends very well for low-income neighbors in Chicago and the uh, retail districts that uh, we're both working in. It's fantastic to be tag-teaming on this uh, work with List Chicago. I've got uh, lots of things I want to share through Lessons Learned, but I'm sure Susan will uh, tease us out during the Q&A, and I uh, just want to, again, uh, thank you all for the work that you're doing, uh, bringing economic opportunities to lower-income communities uh, in your respective markets. And I'll pass it back to Susan. Yes. Thank you, Calvin. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you, Emily. Um, there is so much that, that we've covered about the social life of streets, about prioritizing neighborhoods, um, and loved hearing about the various models of activation. And as someone who is in Chicago, um, thrilled to see some of those models brought to a, a broader audience. So thank you for all of that. We are having some questions coming in. And um, so I'm going to weave, and I had a couple questions prepared, but in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is sort of try and weave things together so that we, um, I'm not into killing birds even with one stone, but we sort of, we try and get to as many as possible. So uh, a couple questions that have come through, and I'll put this to Calvin and to Adriana are about how all of these programs are being capitalized and where's the funding coming from that. And the piece of my question that I will also weave into that, if you could, is sort of how it, over the past year has, have you seen your funders think differently about risk? How has pricing changed? Are there new capital tools emerging? And as always, sort of what else is needed um, to help you achieve what you are, are working towards? So Adriana, if you're with us, I know you've, uh, there's always technical difficulties, so I think you're with us. Can I take that question to you first, if you're ready? Yes, thanks so much, Susan. Uh, so for the KCT, we have uh, two kind of sources of funding. So one are grants, um, thinking kind of along the traditional nonprofit construct. Um, and those are uh, oftentimes directed at capacity building. So thinking about planning and strategies, engagement along with residents and business owners, um, and then general operations. Right now, the neighborhood trust, we are a staff of one, which is just myself as the executive director. Uh, and then we just secured funds to bring on a full-time community organizer as well. And then in terms of the assets that we're bringing in and developing, uh, those are being funded by program related investments and mission aligned investments from foundations. Uh, the first of those dollars have come from local Philadelphia based foundations. We are now um, taking it broader to a national context around model making and place making, um, really thinking about scalability and replicability of this model uh, in other neighborhoods that have some of the similar issues uh, that Kensington has been facing for some time. Um, and then for those who are just 
perhaps not familiar with program related investments and mission aligned investments, uh, those are very low interest patient um, capital terms that are provided by foundations. Um, typically interest rates significantly below what um, a traditional banking institution or CDFI could provide. Um, so currently all of our debt is held between zero and 2%. Uh, and then in terms of the overarching terms for the uh, loans, they're typically structured between 10 and 15 year terms amortized over 30 years. Um, and there are often on the front end interest only repayment periods so that the project has some, some time and some space to become viable and sustainable financially. Thank you so much. And, um, and Adriana, are you seeing any changes in terms of sort of pricing or risk or um, sort of the, the temperature of your funders over the past year, if you will? Yes. Uh, so I would say when the KCT first started uh, kind of really kicking off its fundraising last year, it was actually amidst the pandemic. Uh, and it was a really challenging time to fundraise, primarily because the KCT model is not a direct service model, right? So COVID hit and a lot of foundations pivoted their funds, rightfully so, towards meeting urgent and emerging needs around health, around food insecurity and housing, um, because the KCT does not meet those types of needs. Um, and we're really more about systemic issues and long-term change. Uh, we didn't really meet a lot of the criteria for those funds that had pivoted. We are finding now here, you know, almost wrapping up the second quarter of 2021, um, that folks are starting to kind of reemerge and move towards the recovery phases of COVID uh, and where KCT, I think, really can hold a spotlight in the space within those funding priorities. Um, so I was just say that last year was just really difficult. This year has become slightly easier. Uh, and I anticipate as the KCT really has proof of concept and moves the theory for, further into uh, really model making, then I think it will become significantly more easy. Thank you so much. Calvin, do you want to weigh in on that? I'd love to. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share that we're having a phenomenal experience in raising capital even um, now. Uh, I don't know if we're post pandemic yet, but as we um, reopen the economy and so many um, stakeholders feel that retail is a risky area, um, we're still succeeding in garnering additional investments to support our commercial retail activities. So we uh, have an enormous amount of support from the banking community, from foundations, uh, from uh, even the federal government, the CDFI fund at the treasury has been very instrumental in helping us shore up our balance sheet that we can continue to um, drive forward in this space. Um, and as I mentioned with Chicago Trend, um, that partner is also working with crowdfunding to bring uh, capital to bear for uh, project development. And then um, what we're seeing are that the pricing for us, uh, and, and we typically don't uh, quote uh, prices uh, because our, our investors see this being a little bit more proprietary, but uh, we've actually gotten uh, increased uh, concessionary uh, responses from our investors uh, um, more recently, and, and that's a good thing. And they, and they tend to be extending the term. So we're succeeding in getting more 10 year or longer investments for the work that we're doing to support commercial corridors and the flexibility um, is uh, on a case by case basis, but we're having some successes. And I want to just highlight um, that we, with our Chicago Trend partner, were able to get uh, an investment for a $5 million from the MacArthur Foundation, specifically for our Activate Retail work, where the foundation essentially uh, gave us uh, the ability to provide more equity like financing to our real estate development customers uh, with an understanding that. Uh, we could um, apply all of our normal processes of, and procedures to um, uh, underwrite and collect on those transactions. And at the end of the day, if uh, for reasons that were out of control of any of us, uh, it didn't work, um, a portion of that investment could be forgivable, which gave us tremendous flexibility. And we could really stick our necks out and work with new developers, developers uh, leasing to um, concepts that were uh, brand new uh, developers with really thin balance sheets um, and in very uh, weak market communities where there is ongoing population loss. So uh, th that's the type of flexibility that allows you to uh, stand up and, and be a strong partner in this work. And then I will note that we had um, um, the last uh, two or three years received an investment from J.P. Morgan Chase uh, through their Advancing Cities initiative, specifically for our retail work and the um, 
pricing on that was phenomenal. The term was 10 years. It really was uh, quite remarkable. And it's with the express uh, support of work in our retail sector. So it gives us a way to be counter cyclical while so many other folks are pulling away, uh, are standing down in their retail lending, we're able to stand up and provide a source of critical capital to developers who wanna make sure that low income communities have the amenities that they deserve. Thank you, Kelvin. And we do have one specific question about the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund and how that's being capitalized. So if you could um, answer that really quickly, I think our audience member would appreciate that. This is that's a great it's a great question. So this is really really simplified. Um, so the uh, central uh, part of Chicago uh, is a very very strong market. There's still an enormous amount of commercial real estate development happening there, uh, even as we've moved through the pandemic. And um, the neighborhood opportunity fund is essentially a density bonus. So. Uh, large project developers in the core of the city want to build wider or taller um, and in exchange for the right to do that there's an impact fee that's extracted and they pay that into the neighborhood opportunity fund which in turn is regranted to these smaller projects at the neighborhood level that um, really activates corridors around the city and the fact that the city has already awarded 60 million dollars uh, since 2016 is very compelling our neighborhoods are starting to feel a lot more dynamic Thank you. That's super interesting. Um, I have a question from one of our audience members about public safety and sort of um, in light of all these, these great programs that we're hearing about, um, certainly one of the headlines that you put up, Calvin, and certainly one that we hear about, it's not just Chicago, it's elsewhere as well, unfortunately, um, is the problem of community safety. And so what is being in, in done to ensure a safe future for neighborhood residents? And I'm going to invite each of you to sort of respond in different ways. Adriana, obviously, you know, what are you hearing from your community members about that issue and how are they, they thinking about, about that? Calvin, um, you know, more, more broadly, how does that factor into your models? Emily, I'm curious if, if there is some sort of safety variable that you use in your assessment of these various corridors um, and how that, so that, that dynamic shows up in, in your research. Um, so this is hot. This is the hard part when I can't see your faces. So I'm just going to have to choose Adriana, if you're with us, would you like to take that first? And then I'll go. Happy to. Yes. Good morning. Uh, so for us, public safety is a huge issue in Kensington. Um, Kensington is a neighborhood that has been, as I said uh, earlier, really riddled with some systemic issues. Um, for us, particularly that, uh, really transpires through increased unhoused populations, actively utilizing opioid populations, um, drug sales are very high, um, crime generally is, is fairly high in this community. And so uh, over the last few years, even kind of prior to the KCT being born, uh, there were a lot of neighborhood groups that were organized around these issues of safety in the Kensington community. And in late January of this year, the Philadelphia Police Department actually, in response to uh, all of that advocacy from the neighborhood and residents specifically, uh, opened up a mini police substation specific to the Kensington neighborhood, right at the intersection, um, kind of the major intersection, Kensington and Allegheny, k and uh, to really kind of provide one additional presence, but also two, um, provide additional officers that are qualified to implement the PAD program, which is the Police Assisted Diversionary Program, um, which provides alternatives to um, you know, law enforcement measures and instead social service and wraparound supports. Uh, so that was one thing. The second is the Office of um, Homelessness Services for the city has also been working to coordinate with service providers to move services um, closer to medical campuses and away from the center of the neighborhood. So Kensington Avenue, which is the primary thoroughfare for Kensington's neighborhood, um, actually has a variety of homeless shelters um, and healthcare providers um, and harm reduction organizations that are based, you know, kind of within the business community in that landscape, um, which has presented a lot of public safety issues um, for the small businesses that are there, as well as for uh, the residents that live in Kensington. So we are seeing um, some shift and change. Um, I do think it's come after many years of advocacy and I think there's still a long way to go. Um, and I do think that public safety will continue to be a concern probably for some time. Um, so for that reason, the KCT, the three blocks that we selected to have dense acquisition and impact in are actually three of the blocks with the lowest crime rates, the lowest vacancy and blight. 
so that we can really solidify those blocks and then move outward from there as if there were kind of like an epicenter. Um, and so that's just been the strategy to try to tackle some of that, you know, hand in hand with some of the other measures that are taking place. Uh, Calvin. Great. Uh, thanks, Andrea, Adriana. So public safety, uh, as uh, I think we all know, is a challenge in Chicago. I, and some of us think it's not quite as bad as uh, the media portrays. Um, but we actually see the uh, reactivation, the activation of these commercial corridors, the creation of jobs where local residents, uh, many of whom are opportunity youth or uh, persons who've got multiple barriers to employment, uh, can get to uh, on foot or with one bus ride or a couple of train stops uh, as a, a key uh, solution uh, to reducing um, uh, crime in our communities. Um, so being a part of an ecosystem that is trying to expand pretty dramatically the number of locally accessible jobs is part of the solution set uh, for us. Um, our Mayor Lightfoot and our uh, Police Superintendent Brown are very focused on expanding community policing activities um, so that the community uh, can trust the police at a higher level uh, and, and work uh, more collaboratively uh, to reduce uh, negative incidents. And, and then uh, across the board, um, many of the Chambers of Commerce and local economic development corporations are really putting the pedal to the metal to increase the community engagement um, so that uh, folks can really own and wrap their arms around the retail districts uh, and protect them. It, it was um, really uh, heartening uh, during uh, the civil unrest uh, last spring to see in my neighborhood, for example, that neighborhood residents literally locked arm in arm um, to make sure that um, the, the, the anger and the frustration that boiled over uh, didn't result in the grocery store that we had finally gotten reopened after nearly a decade um, was protected and, and not vandalized. Um, and, that, and that came from how hard the Chamber of Commerce and other stakeholders in the neighborhood have worked to uh, build that level of community engagement around our corridor. Um, and then uh, there's a, an, an emerging uh, uh, network of uh, violence interrupters uh, who are partners with the chambers, with the city, uh, and other stakeholders to try and tamp down on the retaliatory violence that can happen uh, in, our, in our gang community. So we're, we've got a number of uh, solutions that we're uh, bringing forward, and uh, we do hope that uh, in time we'll be able to uh, reduce the amount of uh, crime that we're seeing in our in our communities. Great. Well, I don't have too much more to add to um, any of, of what was uh, said by Calvin and um, Adriana, but I will say I'll just point out the importance of having housing um, close to retail, housing above stores, um, so that you have this kind of active uh, eyes on the street uh, engagement with the what's happening on the retail corridor, a sense of ownership of the neighborhood. If you get a separation between the retailers and where people are living, that uh, invites all kinds of problems and lack of ownership, lack of stewardship. Um, and the other thing I'll say is the importance, and I think Calvin was mentioning about this sort of dynamic, and I'm really impressed that Adriana has this three block area that they're really focusing on, because I think that is that ability to kind of aggregate resources and get your biggest bag, bang for the buck by, um, you know, focusing on a uh, sort of retail core that you small neighborhood retail core that you're gonna activate and make that be the, the focal point rather than um, sometimes investments get pretty disaggregated along a corridor. And so you don't get that kind of um, aggregation and economies of scale um, uh, happening. So, and that activation and centrality, um, that kind of nodal approach to retail that can be a, a real deterrent to crime in those areas. So, um, so it, it, to me, it's all about um, you know uh, activation of the corridor, not having vacancies, you know, having a vibrant life going on in the retail corridor. Thank you. That was um, it's a very interesting. One other question that we have coming through. Um, I'm going to pull the lens way back, and we're going to go to the federal level very, uh, for the, the next question. Obviously, there's a, a lot of resources um, that are being deployed from the Biden administration to activate vacant land, um, to create community amenities, uh, build community wealth, all of these things. 
Um, our question that coming from our audience member um, is, I'm, I'm going to frame it a little bit differently, is, is, is this are these the, the funds that are needed? I know we're early days and figuring all those out and the, the devils are in the details and the, there are strings attached. Um, but are you seeing what is um, being needed, being targeted to the right places? Um, are there things that that are missing? Sort of where, where are those gaps that, that often are, are become quite important? Um, again, Adriana, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with you if that's all right, and then Calvin, and then invite uh, Emily if you have thoughts on this as well based on your research. So Adrian. Yes, thank you. So the KCT at this time, we are not currently accessing government funds, um, not city or state. We did receive uh, one small subgrant from the USDA for a planning process around healthy food access on the corridor and thinking about ways to attract that and make that a viable business solution and something that is sustainable. Um, and thinking about local kind of um, sourcing and production. Um, but aside from that, we have not received government funds. I will say that I think my experience so far has been with the KCT um, that it is difficult to attract government funds to this work because it is innovative and so different from what is typically occurring when we think about economic development or community development. You know, I think also Kensington is a space that is um, really well populated with service providers. We have three CDCs within a very small uh, area surrounding where the Kensington Quarter Trust is focused, one of which has direct overlap um, and was one of our founding partners. And so they are the recipients of lots of um, government grants and funds. So I think there are opportunities for us to collaborate um, and cross pollinate in that way, but I have not yet seen an interest um, from any of the government offices locally all the way up to federal to really invest in a model that's decommodifying assets, taking them out of the speculative market and putting them into neighborhood control. So Susan, I'm probably gonna come at it from a slightly different angle than Adriana. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm with you, my sister. Um, so uh, I, I, I just wanna applaud um, the uh, Biden administration, Biden-Harris administration's framework in general. Uh, the idea that we have the White House talking about uh, closing the wealth gap um, and uh, uh, racial injustice and racial equity is phenomenal. Um, CDFIs and um, community development corporations, um, national housing organizations are, are working uh, in lockstep with the administration across a number of agencies that are pushing forward initiatives and programs and uh, new funding uh, channels um, to promote community development across the board uh, from HUD to Treasury to the Department of Commerce. Um, I just want to be a little bit detailed uh, in responding to your, your question or to the participants question, Susan, in that even in um, the Biden-Harris administration's um, American Jobs Plan, the larger uh, proposal, there, there are so many elements of it that will support stronger commercial corridors. Um, to Emily's point, there are at least three or four pieces that would support more um, affordable housing and mixed income housing development. Much of that Emily will be in mixed use developments like the ones that QCDC and CNI are, are driving forward. Um, there's even the Neighborhood um, Homes uh, Investment Act, which will uh, help fill in the single family residential structures and weak neighborhoods to provide more um, uh, rooftops for retailers, uh, if you will. Uh, there's more support for childcare facilities, which is a part of the uh, ecosystem uh, in communities and also attracts families to neighborhoods. There's broadband support, environmental and climate resiliency support. Um, even with the new market tax credit, uh, the infrastructure bill would make that permanent. And I think we all know in commercial real estate development and low income communities, uh, one of the most important uh, financial tools we have is the new market tax credit program. So having that made permanent uh, will be very beneficial for communities. Um, there's even a, a brand new uh, initiative, Susan, um, that's at least um, uh, programmed at $10 billion in the infrastructure bill. Um, uh, from uh, Biden-Harris that's got $10 billion for uh, comprehensive um, community development initiatives uh, that uh, almost always include uh, revitalizing uh, neighborhood retail corridors. So the Biden and Harris, the Biden Harris administration really is taking a whole of government approach um, to how uh, to bring this kind of quality of life equity to lower income communities, both urban and rural across the country. And uh, we'll, we'll see uh, what we can get done uh, in the 117th Congress. Uh, 
Well, I'll just say that, uh, you know, I, my field is urban design. And when the federal government has gotten involved in um, urban design matters, they don't have a great track record. Um, and because everything is large, everything's mega, everything's big scale. And that doesn't do well for the kind of activated uh, Main Street corridor that, um, that I'm envisioning anyway. Um, so one thing that they are doing, I'll just mention quickly, that I think is really amazing is funding this uh, effort to turn highways into boulevards. Um, and get rid of the um, previously federally funded highways that just bulldoze through parts of the city and wiped out entire neighborhoods. And the effort is to get rid of some of those and create boulevards. And you know that could be a great way to kind of uh, get the community put back together and opportunities for retail investment there as well. All right, thank you. And I know we are we are right up against time. Um, this has been an amazing conversation. I want to thank each of you, not only for your time this morning, but also sincerely for the, the work that you do. I, I know it's not easy, and um, but your remarks have all sort of, I think, given us hope that we're moving into a phase of, of recovery and rebuilding. And it, was, it sounds like the, the tools are in place or coming online that's going to enable us to do that. Um, so Calvin and Adriana, thank you for your, your sort of on the street work. Emily, the, the research um, is so vital to advancing all of this as well. So I'm grateful for that. And um, I know that there are many of our audience members who are engaged in this work as well. So I'm going to extend a thank you to them and thank you to them for spending this time with us this morning. Uh, normally, this is when we would do a round of applause for our great panelists, um, but I'm just going to have to express my sincere thanks and gratitude and leave it at that. So with that, I think we are adjourned for this session. Thank you.